Okay, so um, I've been making some videos lately and they've been running out of time. Sorry about that. I just go until I, I do run out of time. <laughs> Sometimes my phones just they have more space than other times and I try to do the best I can to put as much space on them as possible. So I wanted to just kind of play catch up with y'all on some things I've been learning. I have recently found a few words that I thought might be of interest to y'all. For example, Rex Sacrorum means the king of the sacrament. Now, king of the sacrament applies to the English kings, for example, King James or King Henry VIII. They even call him Henry Rex. And I can show you in the Matthews Bible where it actually gives him that title. Now, the king of the sacrament means the king of the mysteries. The ancient use of sacrament means mystery. And sacrament is not a, is not a word found in your Bible. Interestingly, in Colossians 2, it speaks about these rituals and the kingly decrees. And if we were to look in the theological dictionary of the Old Testament, it would explain to us that the king's stamp of approval on this dogma, that is a decree, is exactly what we should be staying away from. Now, there's kind of a paradox here because the the kings like God is our king Jesus Christ the king whatever he has said we do obey because that he has put his stamp of approval on that so that's not the same as a, a man king though we're talking about the almighty God of heaven and earth which brings me to the English word God. The Torah, or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, have been called the Elohic texts, which, if you mean El Elohic as in Elohim, then it is the Elohic text, but when you hear someone who is actually a fundamentalist speak of the Elohic text, what they mean is that however we define what our beliefs are about the Trinity and like there actually being three gods spoken of in the Bible, that's why they call it the Elohic text. They're not talking about Yahweh, who is the God of the Bible who became person in Jesus Christ when it says that he became flesh and dwelt among us, that word dwell is means to pitch his tent or to tabernacle. So he inhabited, Yahweh inhabited a human body, which was Jesus Christ. And when he died and resurrected, the form of that body became the ecclesia which is now the body with him as the head upon the earth, and he's in the heavenlies. So wherever the head is, there is the body. Wherever the body is, there is the head. And we can see this concept in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, Let there be light. The earth without form is the same as to say that a person living in the void and darkness, if the state of ignorance, like ignorance is bliss, 
has to be awakened and you're awakened by that light or by sound, right? It's like sounding the alarm. <laughs> so the alarm wakes you up in the morning and you go to work. Well, God has to wake us from our slumber and snap us awake from our sleep. So what the world is doing, and I am speaking of a global conspiracy, as it says in Psalm chapter 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and they gather themselves against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from off of us. Well, it's interesting that human beings don't ask, where did this earthly government come from? Where did these schools come from? Where did these businesses come from? Where does these banks come from? And ask questions. I love referring to that Angry Birds moment where Red says, um, about the, in reference to the pigs, he says, you're not asking basic questions. And that's what I would like to speak to the world about is that we're not asking basic questions. Excuse me. So if people would ask these questions, you would soon find that the Rex Sequorum, the kings of these sacraments who are ritualizing the people, which God forbids, we would become under attack. I didn't understand what had happened to my military career until I actually got out and moved to Tennessee to join a church <laughs> that people run around and talk behind your back and they spread messages. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20, it explains that don't curse the king, no, not in your bedchamber, for um, a bird of the air will go and tell the matter. And that's what I learned is whoever these people view as their Pontiff Maximus, their Rex Sequorum, or their Collegium Pontificate, these colleges, these kings, these ritual manufacturers, they run to them because they esteem these men highly as kings. And they, they worship these men and they worship these institutions. So rather than learning, and I know that these words aren't always seemingly scriptural if you were to define them, so I'm using them in a purely new sense here. Rather than using dialogue and learning the like dialectic and heuristic thinking and practicing questions and answers like a, a real life catechism between people and so you learn to din in what people what kind of things people are saying and you can measure that up whether it's true or not just from looking at history and looking at etymologies and looking at definitions to see if the things that these people are saying are actually adding up and then having a form of self-education, but I speak as one who set, believes that Christ is working through us. So what we learn is that men are controlling men by laws and by rituals. They aren't interested in understanding the living God who actually works in our heart. And by heart, we're talking about our 
intellect, our soul, our strength, like our vitality, our life force. They're not looking for God who works through those things. They're looking for the pyramid scheme to get rich with this Rex Seclorum and Pontiff Maximus who's at the top of things, running things. Sorry if I adjusted a little bit here. So where I was going with that earlier is that we have been hijacked. Our brains have been... There's a, there's a movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, as I think is what it's called. And what actually ends up happening to him is they actually end up giving him a lobotomy where they take out a part of your brain. JFK had a sister, John F. Kennedy, and she actually had one of those, and they said it went wrong. Well, if you cut out a piece of someone's brain, then I think you actually get exactly what you wanted. I'm not sure how you could accidentally mess up a lobotomy. That's like a meant to mess things up. That's why they would give a person one. Well, Jack Nicholson in that movie actually gets one. And that's what they have attempted to do to us. They want us to be perpetual children. Now, again, you have a bit of a paradox because in the kingdom, Jesus says that we should be like children in the way that we're kind and innocent and friends with one another. But it doesn't mean that you never grow or flourish into adulthood as is natural. Well, by sending us to school and by spending 20 years in school, some, I mean, 13 is a lot, but then if you do follow on school, they actually, they teach us to be good at being compliant to authority. And there's another thing that it I learned through how that affected my military career is that I went in and I didn't realize that like all the world wants is compliance and the school had turned me into that. As I began to grow, it didn't work out well for me because I actually began to question authority and whether it's business, military, school, government, that's completely out of line for them. So I I find it amazing that even as being a Christian, a practicing Christian, we want God as our government. We want God to take the reins and rule, which he does. But in a world that's governed by wicked men, that looks to them like anarchy. So they would actually consider us like anarchists. And the word radical actually means you want to get down to the roots of things. And (laughs) so with Jesus Christ as our root and God as our root, they also consider consider us radical. So do the logic there. They consider us like radical um, anarchists. I hope I didn't say atheist earlier. I meant um, anarchy. So they consider us radical anarchists. And that word arc, the archons, is our arch means rule or start as in a beginning. Like the Septuagint, in the beginning is our chaos, our when the scripture says, um, in the beginning was the word, I'm pretty sure that that right there is our chaos too. So I don't always know the exact word, but I know it's arc, and I don't always know the word endings because I'm not like fluent in Greek. So as I said, the seven things that come out of man is that wickedness. So when we have our ear opened, as it says in, um, I believe it's Psalm 140, I can't remember, but 
It says, my ear hast thou opened, and that word open means dig. So faith cometh by hearing. The scripture actually teaches that circumcision is of the ear. Circumcision is of the heart. So we can actually hear God's word, and that well is dig. That's what that means when the, my ear hast thou opened. It, it's either Psalm 40 or Psalm 140, I believe. So most people are incapable of learning godly wisdom, wisdom that is towards family, a family that has been made family by adoption. The scripture teaches that the Father works through us. And that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, your father is the devil. He's saying the one working through you is the devil. And he says, I, I do the works of my father, which is in heaven. So he's, that speaks to us that the father works through us. And what a son is in the scriptural context is an inheritor. And we've been made sons by adoption, the scripture says. And in Romans chapter 8, it says, the spirit of Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And so the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ is Christ working through us. And that's what he meant there in um, John chapters 14 through 17, right in that area, when he says that I and my father will come to you. I will not leave you fatherless, but I will send the, the comforter, the paraclete. And that, that's even an English word if you say, if you speak to your phone and say, oh, okay, Google. <laughs> I didn't want to say it too quick or it would have came on my phone. You say define paraclete, it'll define it for you. You just got to enable the okay, Google. So just enable it and then you can speak to your phone and say that and say define, define paraclete or define certain words. So Christ has to smash those seven things that are working in us, which are makes us wicked, which is like murders, adulteries, thefts, fornications. And he says, this is all that's in the heart of man. And like in Genesis chapter six, he says that the earth was, all of their imaginations were only evil continually. Well, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, the legend, the leaven of the Sadducees is what swells us up. So if we get this worldly authority, this money and these teachings and this in intelligence that is a different intelligence of lies and falsifications and doublespeak, we are working on perfecting the wickedness from within. But once God smashes those and takes over the reins of our heart, he becomes the one who works within us. That's what the scripture teaches. I mean, Jesus even says in John 10, and this is very disturbing for some people who don't look into the deep things of scripture. He says, if the word of God has come unto you, and the scriptures cannot be broken. And he says that ye are gods. Are you putting me to death because I say I'm the son of God? And we are inheritors by adoption. We are the sons of God, the scripture teaches. And he gives us those blessings and we inherit them. For as it is written, the elder shall serve the younger. It kind of comes to mind there. And it's talking about Jacob and Esau. Because the older person is always supposed to get the inheritance. That's the way the world feels. Well, the older people were, is Moses in the synagogue, and the new people is Christ and dwelling in the Ecclesia. So, and that whole picture is there with Adam when he had a son, and then Cain, which is the religious people, kill Abel, which are the people standing for God. Seth is the substitute. Well, in the same way, the religious world will want to kill the believers and or the, the religious world killed Jesus and then the substitute, which is the Ecclesia, came through that and from that. 
is really, really deep. And it shows you how the Bible from one end to the other is true. And um, speaking, for example, to astronomy, the Bible calls people stars, like governors are called stars. And the stars are in the firmament. Psalm 19 says, even the firmament, even the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. We see from that that Jesus is the morning star, and it says, and Peter says, the day star rise in our heart. And then um, even in one part spot, it says Lucifer, how art thou fallen, Lucifer, son of the morning. And Satan always tries to look like Christ. So you can see why he's called a star and Christ is called a star. Because as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he's always trying to look like Christ. So governments are called the earth. The governors are called the heavens. So the stars would are a picture of the governors. And even planets, planeo is the word for er in the scriptures or sin. Nod for Cain means wandering, and the wandering stars are the planets. And it says in Revelation that there's a woman speaking of the bride, and she has 12 swords around her head. Well, that would obviously point to Maseroth, as it speaks in Job, which is the 12 stars of the zodiac, and Zod means walk. But I'm not speaking of these things as in the form of um, the false teaching of astrology, but the fact that God says in Psalm 19 that those things speak of the story of God. And Josephus even says that he had eight Gentile witnesses that showed that the antediluvians, which means before the flood, lived so long so they could bring about this story in the stars. And that's why we find Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, and even today in astrology, they even pervert the message of the stars. Licentiousness is our um, pride is the corruption of personal dignity. Astrology is our pride is the corruption of personal dignity. Adultery is the corruption of the marriage relation. There's there's a couple more I can't remember. But then it goes on to say that astrology is the corruption of God's true message in the stars. That's where you get all those things about like Zeus or Mercury, Mercury's Hermes, and then they try to make Paul Hermes. And then that same thing happens in the Roman Catholic Church or the Jupiter. They would say that Jupiter and Hercules and Christ are the same, or they would say that that. I believe they called Peter one of them. I can't remember. I believe they called him Jupiter. So you see how they corrupt these things and this whole pyramid scheme of money making to where they capitalize on these things and do it to the destruction and to the negligence of having a true sound love for God or a true love for brethren. And these things hurt. I, um, I've actually been through a lot because of these corruptions, because I loved God dearly, and I loved the people that I thought loved God dearly. And it's just come to show that as Jesus said, that some seed falls by the wayside and some fall on the rocks and the ones that are choked out by the world and the wayside and the ones on the rock, their root is scorched. They didn't have any root. They begin to sprout. And the devil comes and steals it away. And then some fall on good ground. And that's all a picture of how God works in our hearts. And he says the seed is the word of God. And then in Genesis 15, it says that thy seed, so shall thy seed be. Speaking of when he told him to go see if thou can number the stars or narrate the stars and tell the story in the stars. And then in Galatians 3, 16, he says, it was speaking of one seed, even Christ. And even that story is in the stars. Orion in the scripture is 
actually a perversion of the picture of Christ that God put in the stars. And Orion, which was, I, I can't, I believe it was Kima. Or it's either Kiso or Kima. One's Pleiades, one's Orion. So Orion actually had a negative term to it because it meant like an imposter. And that's what the Nephilim, even the Nephilim, when it says the giants, they'll say it refers to the the o Orion. And what this is a picture of is the whole concept of apotheosis and how these Rex Sequorum try to set them in the Pontiff Maximus. They put themselves in the College of Pontiff or the Pontiff Collegium. These leaders try to set themselves in these like the Acropolis and the Pantheon, which is the high building that they made for their gods and these all the gods, and that was in Greece, in the way that they teach these falsities so they can set themselves as though they're in the heavens and they build these high places and they rule our lives even though they're not in our houses or in our families and they, they're control is felt within the boundaries of our home, sadly. And we, as the, the people who lived in these lands before we did here in America, which isn't America, that's just what we called it, they weren't civilized, they said. They were savages, but being one with nature again and to actually become and live a real life, like a life that's not so disattached from nature. That's way back in the past now, since Cain and Nimrod and all of them built those cities. And now the cities are like these control mechanisms that control our lives. And all of this technology and spying it's just, it's getting, it's like out of control. It's amazing. We're born into truly amazing times. And what's even more mysterious is that God is in control of all those things. And he tells us that he will protect us in these things. And that's what is something to be thankful for. Don't get involved with these false religions and false rituals. There's four, I like the, here's the a saying, four and four, right? Jethro said, able men who love God, hate covetousness and love truth. And then they, they fear God, love truth, are able, and they hate covetousness. And then there was four decrees given in Acts. It was, don't eat things strangled, refrain from fornication, don't eat blood, and I, I can't remember the last one, uh, flee from idolatry, I believe it was. So if you do those things between what Jethro said and what James said to write the churches, and they did write the churches and the churches rejoiced because they understood the freedom that they had, in their worship towards God and the to love God and love the brethren, the two greatest commandments, is that things will be well. It doesn't mean that you'll have a prosperous life, like a prosperity gospel, but it means that when you die from this short life of maybe 70 years, you get to go and live eternally with the Lord. And since most people don't, and they go in the wide gate, that means most people are going to hell. And we can speak to that as well. Hades is a place, as we see from the rich man who died, and he went to hell. He lifted up his eyes, and he could actually see Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and the Hades means the place of the unseen, and it's like in the Sheol, which is the Old Testament word for its equivalent to Hades. He was in the the crypt, like we have the word crypt in the English. 
and he could see Lazarus and Lazarus could see down there. And there's a great gulf fixed in Hades between where Lazarus was, a great, a great chasm. That's the Greek word, the chasm was fixed so that you couldn't pass between the two. So, well, anyways, I hope that this helps, and I just wanted to share some things with y'all. All right, y'all take it easy. Bye.